Okay, thank you, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, uh, SSAI, for uh, creating this session. And um, Joe, this is not smart thought; it is completely different. <laughs> it is safe thought, and this is some kind of the opposition against. If we got time for the discussion, we will we kind of agreed on having this discussion because this is a fight across the Atlantic, from Europe and, uh, and the U.S. I have no conflict of interest other than I'm chairman of the fellowship program in pediatric anesthesia and, of, and I'm a part of the Safe Todd as well. We will look into the background of why do we have this issue of uh, the need for talking about uh, safe anesthesia for kids, especially the, the small ones. We will deal with the organization that should be created and some of the clinical stuff that should be uh, in order before we can discuss some of the other things. The uh, vision for us is that, and I guess that no one could argue against the first one, that all pediatric patients receive anesthetic service by the highest possible stand standard. And then you can, of course, argue by the next one. But this is my personal opinion. That should be the highest obtainable vision in that sense. Um, somehow it originates from from a statement from the Food and Drug Administration from December last year saying that we shouldn't, rough, roughly, we shouldn't give anesthesia to children below three years of age and pregnant women uh, due to the risk of um, severe brain damage, as you could put it. And as Joe said from Boston, that more or less they're not giving anesthesia to kids below one year of age, uh, elective cases at least. And that is due to the potential neurotoxicity of the anesthetic drugs that we're using. We should even, according to the FDA, discuss with the parents, and this is not just the parents from the elective cases, but we have to discuss this with the parents to all cases, even the ones that we have to do, uh, that it could be um, a potential harm, it could be potential harmful to um, be exposed to anesthetic drugs early in life, then their children could have uh, some kind of um, neurobehavioral defects later on in life, could be having d delayed speak, speech, having delayed uh, development, uh, sitting behind in the classroom, in the schools, and etc. And it's all our drugs, except for very few of them. They are, it's a class effect acting on the same uh, transmitters, neurotransmitters, or the receptors. So it's, it's basically all the tools that we have in our toolbox regard regarding medicine. So we have substantial evidence from animal studies saying that it is dangerous to be exposed early in life to anesthetic drugs. We have some evidence from epidemiology studies saying that um, if you are exposed early in life as a human being, then you have problems later on in life. However, you have uh, also very strong evidence from very good conducted studies from, uh, among others, Denmark and the Netherlands, saying that it is maybe there's not this link that you have in the animal studies. And in the US, the FDA and a lot of uh, pediatric anesthetists, pediatricians, and so on, has joined in this uh, smart touch uh, network, trying to um, have more focus on this, trying to, and it's really a noble um, task to have more money for this research. You could also argue that you have a lot of people depending on this research. It is their living um, to do all this research, their career, their their food, their houses. Uh, so you have to have this uh, network, you have to have this funding all the time. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's a property that you, um, you will live up yourself. Um, so in Denmark, we, uh, we have a problem with this. So we ended up writing a notice to our colleagues, and when, when you distribute that to journalists, they immediately um, yeah, twist the wording a little bit around. So for Joe, this is um, the Danish anesthesiology being in war with the FDA. Um, so far, no bullets have been fired, but it's just some kind of um, illustrating this conflict 
Do we believe in neurotoxicity or do we not believe in, in a clinical context? Uh, I wouldn't argue that there could be potential harm in, um, in exposure early in life um, for babies or neonates, but there could be something that's much more important to focus on than neurotoxicity. And this is where the safe touch uh, come into the picture. And recently there's been numerous of papers, editorials, dealing with this issue, uh, then maybe uh, we shouldn't follow the FDA uh, recommendation that vigorously, uh, at least not in European countries. So there's substantial evidence that um, we cannot, at this moment, find the link, the smoking gun, from the potential harm of uh, anesthetic drugs and the harm in children. In uh, one of the best conducted uh, studies so far has been the GAS trial, where you compared general anesthesia to awake regional anesthesia. In, uh, with two groups have uh, around 360 uh, children below 60 weeks of gestational age for a simple procedure, hernia repair. So you had one group uh, in general anesthesia, one group only regional anesthesia. And the primary endpoint is five-year follow-up uh, of, of, um, of how they are doing, performing um, neuropsychology. But the two-year follow-up couldn't find any, any difference between the two groups. So, so far, this gas study, and I will be, I, I don't know, I haven't seen the data, but I'm, I would be very surprised if they can come up with a difference. Safe touch. It's trying to focus on some of the basic stuff. This, of course, some of the safe touch uh, components are um, maybe personal opinions, but they are based on some evidence as well. It was founded some years ago, primarily from uh, some, some nice people here from uh, Germany, uh, Switzerland, and, uh, and also um, uh, Tom from Odense. But later on, <laughs> more and more people are getting involved in the safety, trying to have the focus shifting from neurotoxicity, some of the basic stuff. S organization. Who's going to perform pediatric anesthesia? Where should anesthesia be provided for children? What should be done? When should it be done? And how should it be done? These are some of the organizational issues that we have to deal with. I know a lot of countries, European countries, have been dealing with centralization of pediatric anesthesia. In the Scandinavian countries, some of you are better than we are, at least in Denmark, where it's been really at, at, at a struggle up the hill to, uh, to have people to understand the importance of having some kind of centralization of these few uh, uh, delicate cases. Just looking in who's going to do this. And I guess, knowing a lot of you in this room, most of you would agree on that it should be some kind of some pediatric anesthesiologist doing these cases. You should have a caseload of some hundreds. There should at least be one uh, below one month of age, a uh, month. Uh, should be a trained pediatric anesthesiologist. Should have a formal, um, should be, there should be formal educational programs like fellowships and supervision of fellows and residents should be in a one-on-one -on -one manner. There are some sparse data uh, with these numbers because numbers are always discussed. Should it be 300, should it be 500, should it be 50? And we don't really know. But this is an old study uh, saying that the, the risk or the, uh, the complication rate uh, rises with the fewer number of cases that you're doing with pediatric cases. Um, one of the latest uh, studies I will come back to later, the Africa study, actually had a tendency towards uh, the more years of pediatric anesthesia training, the fewer complications you had. But of course, the, the study was not designed to prove that, um, but you have a tendency toward that. Uh, this is a large American database of cardiac arrests, and not surprisingly, the older you get, the more risk of having a cardiac arrest. But surprisingly enough, or maybe not surprisingly enough, the large majority of cardiac arrest occurs for the children be below one year of age. Just saying something that this is not a small adult we're dealing with. There should be some other competences 
for the physician dealing with, um, with pediatric anesthesia. This is the apricot data. Apricot study was conducted throughout the European uh, uh, continent in many, many centers. You had two weeks of data collecting, and it was actually a quite robust study with uh, almost 90% of all cases during those two weeks. Uh, each institution could define their own two weeks, but it managed, uh, at, at the end, almost 90% of all cases were registered in the apricot database looking into complications of pediatric anesthesia in the European countries. So one of the best conducted trials, previously it has been looking back into the cases, but this was kind of a prospective designed uh, study, uh, primarily conducted by ESA, but with the support of, of the pediatric society, pediatric uh, anesthesia society as well. You can see that the younger you get, the more complications you will see and the complications are mainly respiratory or cardiovascular complications. So you would anticipate more complications dealing with smaller kids. It's just another brick in, in the centralization and who's going to perform these difficult cases. I strongly, <laughs> we are several people strongly believe that a formal education could be a part of this evolution. We have in the Scandinavian countries the um, SSAI Fellowship in Pediatric Anesthesia, as we have other educational programs as well, the intensive care, pain, uh, perioperative care, obstetric, etc. Um, one good reason for a fellow to join up with this program is to, of course, be better, to have better clinical skills, and then, of course, to maybe have a higher chance of getting the next good position. Secondly, the departments paying for this, uh, they see a benefit that they would have better employees. And of course, maybe they would be better in, in recruiting people. So this is really, so you benefit the individual, you benefit the department, but also if you look at it, you would actually also benefit from the pediatric anesthesia in itself if you, if you link a fellowship to some kind of development, some demands in developing the pediatric anesthesia in itself. And we will come back to that, and, and Matthias will be the next speaker. It's an excellent example on how mandatory components of a fellowship actually could evolve into something that would improve pediatric anesthesia. This is just an example of, of how we increase the number of fellows. So it's just not for uh, the university centers anymore. It's also, we're also educating anesthesiologists, pediatric anesthesiologists for regional hospitals. So we're actually taking the responsibility of, of uh, training people to do not just highly specialized cases, but also um, could say more common cases, which are the f by far the most numerous of them. So where should it be done? The specialized cases, single ventricle, gastroschisis, no one would argue that should be centralized in, in, in very few places, but you could go with age as well. So the difficult, the small ones should be centralized in pediatric centers with dedicated anesthesia teams. This goes for neonates, this goes for uh, infants. You should have a 24-7 service able to handle these patients. You should also had, have a caseload large enough to maintain the volume of two to 300 cases per year per consultant. So it would be, if you have five to seven consultants in one unit, it would be 1,000 to 1,500 cases a year. And you should have all the backup functions. I've just wrote, uh, written uh, the, the PQ and the pain service could be numerous others, the pediatric surgery, pediatric cardiac ser service, etc. This is just some of the things going on in Copenhagen. This is our new pediatric hospital. <laughs> this will be finished by the end of uh, seven or eight years. But it's just a saying that um, if, you, if you start planning on these things, it will, um, it's the best way of creating this structure because I believe that once this one is built, it will be um, probably it will not end up being the best in the world, but it may be the second best then. But it will still be kind of the motor, the engine for thriving a, a process of better pediat pediatric service altogether that people will look into that and compare themselves to this. 
I would like to work in an institution that people would like to compare themselves with. So I've been dealing with this. And then we have to discuss this uh, when issue, because I don't think we should be where they are moving in the United States, and of course they have to, do, have to be there because of uh, the FDA regulations. But we don't perform anesthesia to healthy children that don't need anesthesia. We perform anesthesia because there's a need for it. It could be a diagnostic procedure, it could be some kind of surgery that, um, that should be done. And if you don't do these procedures, you might end up with having kids that having a delayed diagnosis or delayed treatment that could impair their development later on. And then you should do the right anesthesia for the right patient at the right time by the right anesthesia team. It brings us on to the next part of the safe touch, which would be the N components, the 10 Ns, where you have the kind of the Five ones here could be some kind of the homeostasis of uh, the well-being of the child. And the later ones could be someone, something related to the cerebral perfusion. Get back to that. No fear. I think we forget this a lot of the times. We are focusing on blood pressure, heart rate, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen. But we forget something really important. There's good evidence that Fear, pain actually impairs development of children. This is a study from our own region in, in, in Denmark saying that out of hospitalized children, one third of them uh, in one single day experience moderate to severe pain. Most of these, of course, out of uh, small painful procedures like needle pokes, uh, sutures, blood samples, etc. But it's really frightening that we, <laughs> we have so many kids experience moderate to severe pain in just one day. Um, distraction, it actually works. So if you have a culture of distraction in your institution, you would have, you would have uh, children better coping with pain. And if you go into neuroscience, I just went in and listened to the um, Nobel lecturer, um, and it's really, really interesting how these neurons modulate themselves. And I think this is some issues that we are overseeing, that um, you could distract the kids from having this sensation of pain that actually could impair the development later on. Something that we really like to discuss and really like to investigate, it's set up a study to looking into this. All these have something to do with the cerebral perfusion. We couldn't argue about this. This could we focus a lot of oxygen. But do we really control the carbon dioxide all the time? Are we really sure that we are not too low? Glucose, do we measure it? Seldomly. Body temperature, I'll get back to that, it's a constantly problem uh, maintaining body temperature, especially in the small ones. So just look at these numbers. What is the correct blood pressure in neonates? We have a 32 plus 4 undergoing uh, general anesthesia. Is it a systolic blood pressure over 45 millimeters of mercury? Is it over 49? Is it a mean blood pressure of 30, a mean blood pressure of 32? Or should it just be if you're happy if your blood pressure doesn't drop below 80% of the baseline? Who would go for the first one? The second? The third? I don't know, the fourth? And the rest of you, the last one, or you don't care? No, actually, all these numbers are, are from, from, uh, from reports, from uh, databases, from studies that are being stated as um, you are hypertensive if you go below this. So they may be all correct, but that could explain some of the differences between uh, studies uh, performed in the neurotoxicity, that you're actually not looking into the same things. It could be something, where, uh, it could be something to do with cerebral perfusion instead of neurotoxicity. Blood pressure, do you always, are you always sure about your, uh, or your cuff size? If you use a too small cuff, you might have 
you'd anticipate the, the blood pressure is correct where it's not. Um, you are using, and most of the time, you will be using an oscillometric uh, measurement, which would actually measure the mean blood pressure, but you're looking into the uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressures, which is calculated. So there's a lot of things going on here, but what we're really interested in is the um, cerebral perfusion. And we have, luckily, a cerebral autoregulation, but what is that in a neonate? We don't know. But probably the cerebral autoregulation is maintained with the lower limit of the blood pressures. The, um, the gas study just recently came out with another publication looking into the difference of general anesthesia versus regional anesthesia. And they saw a relative risk of 4.6 for having hypotensive uh, episodes with a blood pressure below uh, 35 millimeters of mercury when you're under general anesthesia compared to regional anesthesia. Interesting. Another study from, uh, from Canada, um, University of British Columbia, where they looked into uh, three or four years of uh, neonatal cases, trying to figure out where is where we're not doing things right. Unfortunately, only 11 out of more than 400 cases didn't have any, um, what do you say, uh, not normal vital signs. So it could be it was severe hypoxemic, quite a large proportion. Um, you could be severe uh, low on carbon dioxide or hypotensive more than half of the cases, um, or you could be low in temperature. So even in a large um, university hospital, we have to admit that we are not focusing, maybe not focusing enough on the basal uh, and the fundamental stuff. This is just from our own institution. This is a gastroschisis repair. Um, first surgery, it looks quite good. Second surgery, uh, some weeks later with a um, gastrointestinal perforation, we just couldn't get the blood pressure up. It stayed low all the time, in despite of vasopressors and fluids and all the other things. So this is the things we are running into. Hypocapnia is a severe threat to um, a young brain. You suspect if you go maybe two kilopascal or lower, then it would be dangerous. But no, you just have to go be just below uh, four. This is a study from from um, from neonates uh, weighing 500 to 1,200 grams in the first four days of life, and if you were just below four, you would see this uh, lesion associated with the um, with the low um, carbon dioxide. Oxygen, yeah. Hypoxemia could be dangerous as well, but we cannot measure it because when you go up, we cannot measure it anymore. We have numerous indication that this is from a, a large database on cardiac arrest. If you are hypoxemic, your uh, mortality risk increases, but it also increases in the uh, upper area. So you should avoid hyperoxemia and hypoxemia. Basically the same, another uh, database. Um, so something related to, uh, to uh, perfusion of the brain. Then the body homeostasis, I will not go into more into this. Uh, just the uh, potassium, glucose, temperature have been issues that we have to control as well. And then we are not completely agreed that we should discuss with all parents that it's dangerous to be anesthetized due to neurotoxicity. But you can find the statements on the Safe Touch uh, initiative uh, homepage on what we recommend to discuss uh, with the patient. So my take home message is that we have to focus on the well-known risk factors. And we have to focus on um, performing safe anesthesia uh, in the proper way. And then, of course, developing uh, some kind of guidance on how to do it uh, the right way. And then, and this is a really hard part, um, some kind of national implementation on where, who, what, when, and how to do this. <laughs>